Welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast, your go-to source for personal, professional, and organizational growth and development. We hope you tune in often for all things people management, organizational development and change, organizational leadership, and social impact related. Maximize your personal and organizational potential with Human Capital Innovations Podcast. Welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. In this HCI podcast episode, I talk with Janine K. Brown about sustaining diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging efforts in organizations. Janine K. Brown, welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. Well, hello. Thank you for having me. I'm happy to be here. I'm super excited to meet you and to have the the chance to chat with you today. We've been preparing for this episode for a while. And as I was looking over your bio again, and just looking at all the great accomplishments uh, that you've had, uh, you know, I just got really excited about the range of things we could talk about. Um, I thought we could focus today uh, in addition to talking a little bit about your, your book, I wanted to focus today on sustaining diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging efforts within organizations. There's lots of conversation around DE&I. Uh, belonging has started to be tacked onto that, which I love. I, I think that's a really important addition to the traditional DE&I conversation. Um, and one of the things that I am always really anxious about is how do we do this in a more sustainable way? Uh, Because it's great when you can start having the dialogue, you can start having the conversations, you can even start to put in place planning um, and those sorts of things. But it it, it can't be a one-off, right? It can't be a one-off. It can't be siloed. It has to be embedded and integrated throughout the organization. Um, And so, you know, how we can go about doing that, I think, is really what I want to explore with you so that we can have sustainable effort and ultimately move the needle, not just talk about things, but actually make a difference so that the lives of people within our organizations and in our communities actually improve. Uh, So that's my hope. As we get started, I wanted to share Janine's bio with everybody. Janine K. Brown is the founder and managing director of Everyday Lead headquartered in Atlanta, Georgia. She is an award-winning leader and an active advocate for increasing women and multicultural professionals to corporate executive leadership roles. Janine, works closely with clients delivering solutions to increase retention, decrease attrition costs, attract new talent, and create competitive advantages through the power of inclusion. Janine has a Bachelor of Science in Accounting from Alabama State University and a Master of Business Administration from Robinson College, Georgia State University. She sits on the ASU Foundation Board, the AICPA Women's Committee, and the City of South Fulton Planning Commission. Janine, again, it's a pleasure to be with you. Thank you so much for taking your time. Anything else you would like to share with listeners by way of background or personal context before we launch into our DE&I discussion? You actually covered it pretty well. So I'm just happy to be here. I think that was a lot about me. And um, anybody else that's interested, they can definitely find more information about me on our website at everyday-lead.com. Perfect. Thank you. And I'll, I'll give you a chance at the end also to share how people can get connected. I thought before we launch into the DEI discussion, we could also just talk briefly about your book. Um, I, I'm always so impressed by um, the great works that my guests have put out and you have a recent book. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, so I do have a book. It is called Unstuck and Unstoppable, Six Strategies to Leverage Your Value, Increase Your mm-hmm. Visibility, and gain recognition to accelerate your career. So it is not a DEI book. It is a book on careers, because that is definitely uh, one of my passions is working with women, helping them to navigate their careers across professions and throughout all sorts of industries. So kind of got back to my roots of working with women and I launched this book and it's it's available now and it's really exciting to be able to impact the lives of women at a variety of different areas in their careers. Yeah, and I love your focus on female empowerment, women in the workforce, uh, and women leadership. 
uh, in all the work that you do, uh, which is really evident in this book. And I know it's not a DE&I book, but I, I think there's a lot of elements there and a lot of lessons that are going to be very helpful for people from a range of backgrounds, diverse backgrounds. And ultimately, when we get into this DE&I discussion, it's all about truly creating equal opportunity for everybody, not just EEO, you know, law as, as dictated by federal law. Um, you know, it's nice to kind of meet that minimum bar. Uh, I suppose that's a slight step in the right direction, but if, if we're truly trying to create a dynamic organization that values diversity, that creates, uh, that, that is equitable, creates an inclusive environment in a, in a culture of belonging where everyone has the opportunity uh, to be their best, genuine, authentic selves at work, do what they do best every day, contribute in meaningful ways, and ultimately drive success for them, their team, and their organization. It all starts with the principles that you talk about in your book, and then you know really how we build that within the organization to break down, to disrupt the, the, the systems, the structures that have perpetuated, um, you know, the privilege and the, in the, in disadvantaging certain populations um, that have historically, you know, been marginalized. So uh, I'm super excited to get into that conversation, but I, before we do, I do want to encourage listeners by, by all means, check out the book. Um, great content there. I think you'll find it very enlightening. Um, lots of great ideas. Um, so thank you for your effort in that work. Thank All you, right. Jonathan. So now to pivot a little bit, um, let's let's focus now a little bit more on on DE and I stuff. Um, this is an area that I have a lot of passion around, and I say that as a straight cisgendered white dude. Um, I do have a lot of passion around this, but I also recognize and acknowledge my privilege, uh, and so I want to amplify the conversation. I want to 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 try to be an ally and to try to help um, others perhaps who are, who don't have the same privileges I do so that we can create a more equal playing field, uh, a more equitable playing field and everyone can truly have opportunity. Um, tell us a little bit about your, your framing around de and work, um, how you got involved in this work and, and perhaps, you know, one or two things that you think are really vital as we uh, consider these efforts within our organizations. Yeah, so John, John, thank you so much for the gracious introduction, the summary of my book. You did it better than I do sometimes. Um, but the the DNI, DE&I, um, for me, it's it's amazing that I'm doing this work. And I say that at kind of in a reflective moment, like while you were talking, I was thinking, wow, how did I get into this? And it's interesting because I'm actually an accountant <laughs> by trade, right? I studied accounting. Um, I was a state and local tax practitioner in public accounting for many years. And while I was in a public accounting firm is actually when I got my first taste of de and I. And back then it was called tolerance. Can you believe that? Like, that's what we called it. Um, we were creating by, by the way, I, I really hate that framing of tolerance, like let's tolerate these people, right? Like <laughs> that's what exactly a- what it was, right? So this was um, early 2000s. It was definitely, that's what we were calling it. And we were celebrating the fact that we were learning to tolerate one another. In retrospect, it was like, just like you said, it's just kind of ridiculous. Uh, however, it was my first taste into it. So while I was um, in public accounting, working at Deloitte, I was tapped to to get involved with our women's initiative first. And um, in the Southeast market and at Deloitte, we were the first large public accounting firm at the time it was five large firms that was putting a lot of effort in creating um, systemic programming to help women become partners in the firm. So that was our focus. How do we keep them? Um, How do we advance them? And how do we ensure that women become partners. And so I spent a lot of time working on that committee um, as, a, as a client service practitioner. So I was not in HR, I was not in people management. And then we started working on um, Black employees. And so I actually helped launch our Black employee network um, in our Atlanta office and then our Southeast market and other um, offices in the Southeast market. And so that was my first taste of it. And then... 10 years later, I'm back in it. We have a firm where we actually were doing talent and leadership development. And a lot of our clients needed this assistance. 
Now, I don't think people should just jump into DEI. I think it's a combination of lived experience, but there has to be coupled with some s- significant learned knowledge about how to address these problems because DEI is not just race and it's not just gender. Now, those are the two things we talk about the most, but it's not just those two things. And so that's how I kind of got into this work. So it started like 10 years and then I moved into some other work 10 years later. And a lot of our clients needed this support. And we were hearing it in the classrooms, in our seminars, these things were coming up. And then we began helping companies really design strategy where what you said about belonging, where DE&I is in the DNA of organizations. Yeah, I love that. And thanks for the, you know, laying out kind of the evolution of how this has come about. Uh, it is super interesting to, to think about, you know, the origins and talking about tolerance. And then we start talking about diversity. We start adding in equity. It seems like we keep on adding letters onto this. Um, and, and I suppose, um, you know, some, in some ways that makes it more complicated, but, but not really. I, I think, I think we're just better understanding and, and as organizations are maturing in this area that we, we start to recognize that, yeah, like getting, you know, getting more, a, a diverse workforce around the table, that's great. So you, you have recruitment practices, you get a, a wider pool, um, you select people and, and you have a more diverse team. That's great. That doesn't necessarily mean anything positive though, for the organization. If you don't move into equity, you don't move into a culture of inclusion. And if there's not belonging, because ultimately the, that diverse workforce is going to fracture and, and they're going to leave, right. If they don't feel supported in what they're doing. And so all of this has to be connected. Um, it, it can't, like I mentioned earlier, it can't be siloed. It can't be like one person, like the chief diversity officer's role to promote DE&I throughout the organization. It has to come from the top, uh, from the C-suite on down, and it has to be embedded, you know, mutual accountability um, throughout the leadership ranks. And really, ultimately, every employee needs to see themselves as playing a role in these DEI uh, and belonging efforts within the organization. Otherwise, you're never going to get to the culture change that's necessary to truly make the difference to drive not only personal success, um, you know, acknowledging, seeing, being with everyone in their difference, and, and le- but then also leveraging that for innovation and for organizational success as, as well. Um, so let's talk a little bit more about the sustained element. You already talked about the initiative that you were involved with um, to try to promote female um, uh, executives and and to get people on that kind of pathway. Um, Maybe you could describe a little bit about what went into that, because that's that's a challenge in and of itself. There's a lot of obstacles to overcome when you're trying to create that kind of a structure of support. Uh, And then we can extrapolate from that and talk a little bit more about what we might do, what that might look like for broader DE&I efforts? Yeah, so I think, you know, when I look back in retrospect, compared to the, how I'm deeply ingrained into this practice now with my firm and my clients, I think the public accounting firms and a lot of organizations, I don't want to just blame the firms, focus on programs, right? We're going to put this initiative in place. And then you have these initiatives like the women's initiative, the black employee initiative, where we're focused on these particular groups. We want to keep them in the firm. We want to recruit great talent um, and the pat and create these pathways. But what that does sometimes, I think when you look at it as a program or as an initiative, it impacts sustainability um, because it's, it's a lot of rah-rah on the front end, but you actually need a strategy to get it to be sustainable. And I think when I look back with what we, what we did years ago when I was in public accounting to what we're doing with companies now is we actually are starting with the end in mind from the standpoint of all of the people in this room are not here. What do we want the company to be? And who do we want to have these experiences? Because this talent is one thing, but we also need our vendors to have a great experience, right? We need to make sure 
our vendor pool is diverse and inclusive, right? The barriers to access to work with these large companies are lowered for some of these, for smaller businesses, right? Because when I talk about DEI, I always want to tell people gender and race and all the other, you know, small, all the other groups that we're trying to focus on are important but they're not as important as putting a system together so that all of those goals can be met. And that's the key thing. So when I say, you know, we are helping our clients put DEI in the DNA of their company so all can thrive, that's exactly what we're doing. So what we look at is every single aspect of the company that's, gen- that's um, revenue generating uh, and non-revenue generating. So the tangible and the intangible. And from the front door to the loading dock, everything is reviewed, every policy, every process um, that affects everything in the organization. So we don't just come in and do programs. We don't just come in and do training because, you know, John, as you said, that's not sustainable. And it doesn't create belonging. Typically, when you put people in the classroom and you start saying, oh, we're going to teach you about your biases, the first thing they do is get defensive. But if we present to them, this is the kind of organization we're trying to create. And we want you to be a part of creating that culture. Then people self-identify their biases because the first thing they say, hey, we got to make sure our our interview teams are more diverse. We got to make sure the vendors that we're working with, that do we have enough women vendors, you know, minority owned companies that are involved, you would be surprised if you enter to those conversations, what I call through the back door, then people start creating policies on their own. I'm excited to announce the publication of my new book from HCI Press, Bluer Than Indigo Leadership, The Journey of Becoming a Truly Remarkable Leader. Early in my adult life, I learned about an Asian proverb that translates as bluer than indigo. If you think about the color indigo, it is a brilliant, deep, and vibrant blue. What some would call the bluest of blues. To have something that is bluer than indigo is rare and truly remarkable. Contrary to popular myth, There is no one-size-fits-all or cookie-cutter approach to effective leadership. There's no silver bullet, no secret sauce, no go-to model that will solve all of our problems. The truth is, great leaders have all had their unique strengths and flaws, and have all had to discover and then pave their own distinctive path in their life's journey to fulfill their leadership potential. Bluer Than Indigo Leadership will help you discover your own path and explore those ordinary, everyday actions that will help you respond to an uncertain future and produce extraordinary results for individuals, teams, and organizations. Yeah, I love that. I think that's absolutely right. Um, Creating kind of a shared ownership around the decision-making process uh, and, and having a collaborative approach to what these DEI efforts are going to look like throughout the organization within individual teams is really important. Now, from an educational standpoint, you know, sometimes it is important to have that training on implicit bias. Yeah, yeah. Maybe people aren't very familiar with that concept and they don't realize it. And to your point, you know, people do get very defensive, walls go up very quickly. And so, you know, you have to create you know, kind of a permission structure for people to be able to acknowledge, you know, those types of biases and prejudices that are baked in that, you know, it's not anyone's intention, perhaps. And, and, uh, you know, you can, you can assume the best of intentions, and you can assume and and be as generous as you possibly can be towards individuals, even when um, negative things are happening, um, you know, as we're all trying to learn and grow and develop in this space. Um, But, but those educational pieces, that training, it's, it's really just like the very first minimal step um, just to raise awareness. Yeah. It's not going to really change anything. It, it's, it's all about the shared collaborative ownership over and shared responsibility for like, how are we going to bake this in throughout the organization? Like you said, 
how do we how do we bake it into the DNA of the organization? And that gets to every practice policy procedure uh, within the organization, uh, both spoken and unspoken, because sometimes there are just norms baked into organizational culture that need to be disrupted. Uh, a lot of times there are systems in place that, you know, maybe they served a purpose at one point in time, but you've outgrown it, you've, you've moved past it, and they weren't the most inclusive in the first place. Maybe yeah. there's no bad intention originally, but the, the matter of the fact is they, they need to be shifted. And so we just have to, we have to open it up, you know, to critique, we need to, to be uh, comfortable enough, we need to be secure enough in our own skin as leaders to allow that level of analysis, that level of critique, so that we can start to identify the gaps, understand those elements that are systemically harming people, whether that's the intention or not, it doesn't really matter. But if the the harm is there, it has to be dismantled, it has to be disrupted, and it has to be re-envisioned and recreated in a more um, healthy way. Uh, And and there's, there's just no shortcut to this. It, it, it only happens as you do the hard, sustained work over time of getting people together. This is going to be many meetings, many discussions, many strategy sessions, you know, many implementation sessions. Like it just, it, it, that has to become a priority within the organization, throughout the organization, if you're going to have a chance of really having this thing take hold. And it's a positive investment in resources, both people resources from time talent, financial resources, right, to work with a consultant, it is worth the effort because, and I'll give you a, a wonderful example. I, could, I wish you and all your listeners could have been on a call I had yesterday with a, a client where we unveiled the DEI strategy to their larger DEI team. So they have all these subcommittees and their BRGs are in place. Um, And we unveiled the new lingo for DEI, the graphic work, the definitions, and the way the people on video lit up, like their faces, their eyes, the smile. And it was a rainbow of different types of people and personalities and experiences, you know, gender for gender identifying uh, individuals. It, but to see the, the, visual visual emotion of everybody on that call was amazing and I said you know what this is why we do this work right because we know that when it's unveiled per se um, and people see that they can all the things that we've talked to them about over weeks of interviews and surveys um, and we bring back to their leadership this is what your employees want This is what they want to experience. And we can sum that up in four letters or five letters. It's amazing. It's it's like a hallelujah kind of revelation type of moment. Um, And I think that's what people are looking for, right? We spend all of our time at work. Like when we're not at work, we're at work. We're not physically there, we're there. On the weekends, we're thinking about work. And so people are so connected to it. They want to know that what they our investing is important um, in the workplace and what they're receiving is valued um, and they feel valued. And so that's why I think this work is important. Um, And John, you mentioned training. Training is necessary, right? It is something that has to happen. Um, And when I think about training and the thing that I encourage my clients to do is to embed the DEI conversation and all the training that we have, right? So even if we're doing a training on the six skills to, you know, dynamic leadership, uh, and it, it feels like just a leadership conversation, it needs to have an inclusive tone, right? As a dynamic leader, how can I be more inclusive? How am I capturing all the thoughts and ideas on my team? How am I making sure that difference is valued on the team, both difference in perspective, ideas, knowledge, um, and, you know, other sorts of cultural differences. And so I think that's some of the things that when I think about training, it's the one-offs, like the uh, conscious, you know, um, unconscious bias, you know, inclusive leadership, but also putting it in everything else. So from the first day someone is onboarded in your organization 
in, through the orientation process, they're hearing this inclusive language and it's in every meeting that you have and we're talking about it. Because I think when we just do training, what we end up with is diversity fatigue. It's like, oh, I gotta go to another DEI training, right? But when it's right. part of our conversation every day, then it's just part of our conversation every day. Yeah, yeah, I completely agree. I love it. Um, you know, I, I think if we can just get past the point of being so scared in the space, and it, it is hard. Like I, I talk to colleagues who are like myself, you know, a middle-aged white dude, um, and even if they have really good intentions and they want to be more inclusive, they're so scared of being in these conversations and saying something, putting their foot in their mouth um, and hurting somebody that they, they basically choose to not engage. They just, they just separate themselves and that's not going to accomplish what we want either. And so we have to create a safe environment where people can learn and grow together, where we can hold each other accountable, but do it in a, in a generous way so that we're not, you know, throwing out the racist card every time someone slips up and says something that is a little insensitive, um, but also making sure that people recognize that, yeah, there's cer certain things that aren't acceptable uh, and there's certain, you know, we, we can do better. We need to do better. We need to hold each other accountable. So if we, you know, if we can create that kind of an environment where it's just baked in to every meeting, we know that our focus is, is around DE and I and belonging that, that um, no longer is it something we have to, you know, explicitly call out constantly, but it's just, it's just part of our nature. It's, it's, it's similar to like talking about employee engagement. I think that's been part of the narrative for so long that most people know that that's just kind of part of the deal. Like you get together in teams, you get together as a leader with your people and you want to be thinking along those lines and you don't have to have constant trainings around it. Hopefully we get to the point where DE and I is in a similar space, where it's just part of what it means to be a great leader and part of what it means to have a great team. Right. And even the employee engagement, right? When we think about that, it has to have this sense of belonging, like you said, and it also has to be a safe place. Right? You talk about all the things that get added on to DEI. Right now, we're doing a lot of work with our clients on creating psychological safety or healthy workplaces. Um, we've seen, and if you follow DEI, you follow this topic, you know, Google has done a study um, related to it. There's of just a lot of conversation. One, because it makes for a more um, productive and successful team um, in these teaming environments when people feel like I can say to someone exactly how I feel, what I'm thinking, and there will be no retaliation. No one will think bad of me. I am free, even if it's off base or wrong, as long as it's not cruel right? It's not combative. I'm not trying to be provocative for provocative for being provocative. I'm not trying to be provocative just to cause, um, you know, disruption on the team. So I think, you know, we're continuing to add these conversations because it's important for people to realize that the goal is for people to be able to walk into the workplace, like you said, and be their true authentic selves. Um, however they define that person for them, their individual selves. But the bottom line is we come to work, companies are formed because we want to be profitable. And if the barrier to profitability is not having a safe workplace, if the barrier is because we're tripping up over gender um, related comments and microaggressions and micro assaults about race, um, or even small things like what school you went to, right? If those are the things that are going to cause us to be, to not be profitable, to be innovative, not be able to, you know, to serve our clients, those are really bad reasons, right? Not to be great. And I think that's what companies are at now. Like we just don't have the time for it because the cost related to lawsuits, the cost related to turnover, um, the cost related to just the slowing down of the workday because of disruptions related to these smaller issues that become really big issues is just too great. Amen. Well said. Janine, it has been a real pleasure talking with you today. Um, I, I note the time. I, I think I need to let you get back to your busy day. But before we close, 
I want to give you a chance to share with listeners how they can get connected with you, find out more about your work, where they can find your book, and then give us a final word on the topic for today. Yeah, thank you, John. So feel free to reach out to our firm. We we are excited to take on new clients, even just to answer questions, right? To discover, help you kind of get on the path to where you want to be. There are a lot of com- companies who are gun shy about jumping into this work and into DEI and they just need some help or just need some direction. So you can reach me at Everyday Lead. Um, that's the name of my firm. Our website is everyday-lead.com. And if you are interested in my book, Unstuck and Unstoppable, if you have women in your organization who you guys, you all are looking for a new uh, book for your book club or some just some tips on how to be more strategic in your career, you can access the book at unstuckandunstoppablebook.com. Um, and I would love to be in touch with you and just to talk with you either about DEI or women in leadership um, and career management. Wonderful. Thank you, Janine. It has just been a real pleasure. I encourage listeners to reach out, to get connected, find out more about what Janine can do for you, uh, to have these conversations, check out her book, check out her organization. And as always, I hope everyone can stay healthy and safe, that you can find meaning and purpose at work each and every day. And I hope you all have a great week. alchemy of truly remarkable leadership, ordinary everyday actions that produce extraordinary results. Consider how the nature of work has shifted over the past 50 years with increased globalization, rapid technological advancement, and the shift in economic composition. The average job of today looks very different than the average job of 50 years ago. What will the jobs and organizations of tomorrow look like? Moreover, what does this all mean for organizational leaders? What are the core competencies and capabilities of organizations and their leadership that are prepared for continued disruption and geopolitical and socioeconomic shifts? Regardless of what the future holds, increasingly, leaders need to be socially minded, data driven, decisive, champions of talent, and disruptors of the traditional notions of leadership, teams, organizations, and work. The alchemy of truly remarkable leadership will help you to explore your own leadership competencies and capabilities and consider ways to apply and implement them into your workplace and personal life. Check out Human Capital Innovations magazine, Human Capital Leadership. Human Capital Leadership is a free interactive e-magazine with the mission to help individuals, leaders, and organizations find innovative approaches to maximize their human capital potential. We publish issues quarterly in August, November, February, and May. Take a look at the latest issue and let us know what you think. Thanks again for joining us for this episode of the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. I hope you stay healthy and safe and that you have a great week. Check out our new weekly LinkedIn newsletter, Alchemizing Human Capital, exploring industry trends via original research and interviews with executives and thought leaders from across the globe. We look forward to having you join us. Check out our new weekly LinkedIn newsletter, Alchemizing Human Capital, exploring industry trends via original research and interviews with executives and thought leaders from across the globe. We look forward to having you join us.